Okay, thanks Steve, and thank you everyone, and those lights are very bright this early in the morning. Okay, well welcome everyone to um, our session, uh, The Quintessential Limits and Possibilities of AI, Three Views. You'll probably hear some things that are a little bit, let's say, um, that are a little bit off, off what you've probably heard um, earlier, earlier this morning. Um, but just before I, before I introduce um, our, our panelists for the remarks, um, I'd just like to say, you know, what, one reason I am a board member and one reason I love Discovery Institute so much is because Discovery Institute gave this little <coughs> band of intelligent design guys a forum and a, pla and a, forum and a platform um, to do the great, work, the great work that they've done over the course of the past, I guess, about 30, 30 years now. And so I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that what you hear here is a diversity of views. You take, we give you the information, you decide yourselves. We don't, you know, sort of, are not dogmatic in terms of saying you need to think this or think that way, but we really just want to give you the information and you can process that for yourself, for, your, for yourselves. So um, thank you for having us. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. So each of our panelists will, uh, will, will, I will introduce them and they will provide their remarks. And then we'll kind of get into a lively discussion. And I think there'll be some interesting things for you, for you to hear today. Okay, so let's get started. So our first panelist is George Montañez. He is an assistant professor of computer science at Harvey Mudd College in Southern California, and he's in his sixth year there. He received his BS in computer science from UC Riverside and in a, a micro, I'm sorry, in MS in computer science from Baylor University and a PhD in machine learning from Carnegie Mellon University. He's worked in industry as a data scientist for Microsoft and as a software engineer and web developer for various small companies. Since coming to um, Harvey Mudd, George has founded the Amistad Research Lab, through which he's mentored roughly 90 research students. And uh, he was awarded Outstanding Faculty Member in 2021 and is a former NSF, um, National Sciences Foundation, research fellow. So George, uh, you have about four minutes. Um, so that's what you're thinking. All right, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, so we're talking about generative AI models, right? And what these systems are, are correlation-based systems. So they encode relations between text and between pixels and gradients of images. And I think one of the surprising things for me and maybe some of the, my co-panelists is kind of how much you can get from these relations in text, right? Um, so text is essentially a model of the world. And it seems that a lot of knowledge about the world is encoded in these relations, at least in a, a Chinese room sort of way, right? Um, that maybe shouldn't surprise us so much if we think about all the things that we could learn from watching. So for those of us who are cited, I think Yogi Berra said, I'll explain that later. I only have four minutes, but, but I will get we'll to get that. We'll get to that. Yeah. Um, so if we think about all the things we learn from seeing, um, images are basically symbols. They're symbols that are representing real entities in the world. And we learn a lot about how the entities in the world interact by the relations among the symbols, right? Um, and so how do these systems do that? How do they absorb these relations? Well, they consume huge amounts of data. So a lot of the talks have been about all the, the data that you need to train these large language models. Um, and we know from theory that the things that power these systems are absorption of data and interpolation among things it hasn't seen that is powered by the assumptions and the biases we put into the systems, right? And so these biases and assumptions, they tell the system how to interpret the data and also, again, how to interpolate beyond the things that it's seen. And so human fingerprints are all over these systems, right? In the architecture choices and the hyperparameterization, regularization, all these things that go into them. Um, so as impressive as they are, the, what we think of as the rationality of these systems is actually highly parasitic on human rationality and human creativity and innovation. Um, you may disagree. You may say, no, you know, I, I asked it to produce a poem, uh, a rap in the style of Shakespeare, and, and no one's ever done that before. And so, yes, it, it could do some innovative remix tasks, but I think it's very interesting in that when you begin to train these systems on their own outputs, they degenerate very quickly. And there's this phenomenon called model collapse, which I, I think some of us are gonna talk about, um, and it's already been mentioned, where if you, you took this room of humans right here and you had us produce text, 
our data would improve the systems over time, and we would continue to improve the systems. If you trapped ChatGPT in its own silicon room, and you told it to just produce outputs and you trained it on its own outputs, it would very quickly devolve. So whatever it is that these systems are doing, um, it's, it's different from what we are bringing to the table as humans. And so I would say as, as systems, they're impressive, vastly impressive, but they're not quite there yet in terms of rationality or consciousness. Um, will it ever get there? So I think that's an interesting question. I don't know, I don't know. Um, I'm not very optimistic about it because I feel that if uh, purely materialist views of human consciousness haven't been able to explain our own consciousness, it, it makes me a little bit pessimistic on trying to produce AI consciousness by purely mechanized means. Right? So I'm open to being surprised, but I'm, I'm not optimistic. All right, thanks, George, and we'll talk more about that. So um, our next panelist is um, Robert J. Marks. He is a distinguished professor at Baylor University and is director of Discovery's Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. He's published hundreds of peer-reviewed papers in the areas of algorithms and AI, and he actually says some of them are actually good. <laughs> Um, he's the author of Non-Computable You, so this is his book. I have read it. I read it over the past couple of weeks. It is a great book, and what I really love about it is it's a very approachable book. You don't have to be a PhD to read it and to understand it. And he, and he also goes really deeply into the history of AI, which has been around for 50, 60 years or so, actually, maybe a little bit longer than that. But anyway, I would highly recommend uh, Bob's book. It's a great book. I really enjoyed it. Um, so anyway... Um, more recently, he, um, he co-edited the book Mining the Brain with Angus Minuge and Brian Krauss. That's a great book, and I will be, I did get that book, Bob, already. Um, which presents new evidence that the human mind is more than just the human brain. So, Bob, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, some, uh, there were some statements that kind of slipped by. And if you weren't watching for them, if your mindset was in another area, you might have missed them. Stephen Rolfram said, and this is a quote I wrote down when he was talking, we're at the edge of training data. In other words, there's no more training data left, especially in terms of text and probably other things. Uh, Steve um, Bala Balabam, the CEO of Lambda, said we are also at the limits of creative AI. We have mined a lot of stuff. Steve Altman, the um, guy that's a head of uh, OpenAI and GPT-3 said, I think we're at the end of an era where AI is giving, uh, it, it, it is going to be these LLMs. In other words, he was saying that the LLMs have kind of reached their limits. There's lots of innovation, there's lots of variations which are going on, but we've basically reached the end. It's interesting to know that all the advances in AI that Wolfram talked about have come in quantum jumps. Nobody, AI does not increase linearly. 1943, and this is kind of a recap of, of Wolfram, 43, McCullen Pitts came up with the first neural network. 1948, Hebb's Law, which says that neurons that are fired together are wired together. 1950s, uh, Rosenblatt's perceptron, I'm more impressed with Rid Woodrow's Adeline, which in the 50s could do things like forecast weather, do speech recognition, and win at the game of 21. 1974, Paul Werbos invented something called airbag propagation. This was another jump in artificial intelligence that allowed people to do things that they couldn't do before. Thank you. Um, and uh, that led to things such as power load forecasting. Uh, most of the forecasting in the United States of power loads for tomorrow is done by neural networks. It also led to the... Um, led to the founding of Heck Nielsen Corporation, which was the first uh, big artificial intelligence um, company that I'm aware of. HNC sold their company, Heck, Robert Heck Nielsen sold his company to Fair Isaac in uh, 2002 for $810 million. If you haven't heard of Fair Isaac, you've heard of FICO and your FICO score, that's the, that's the FI in FICO. Uh, 1990s, the convolutional neural network came along. This was really great because it did away with something that we call the curse of dimensionality. 
It allowed one to look at actual pixels of images and use pixels of images to classify the images. 1997, reinforcement learning made its uh, goal. Two th 2014, there was a paper on GANs, generative artificial neural networks. 2017 is attention is all you need, which led to chat GPT. Now, I want you to notice that all of these were little jumps in artificial intelligence that were not due to artificial intelligence. In other words, the, the GANs did not write the attention is all you need paper. That was written by the ingenuity and, and the creativity of human beings. So each of the jumps that we have in artificial intelligence is due to human ingenuity. In fact, um, those the, the, there are some people that believe that AI is going to go on, it's going to be conscious. Nobody ever defines what consciousness is. Uh, they just kind of wave their hands. It's going to become more intelligent. Nobody defines what intelligence is going to be. If AI is going to be a thousand times more to intelligence, how do, how do we measure that? Um, in, in fact, I believe that uh, there are brick walls that artificial intelligence will never go through. We're not just going to get better and better and better and better. This goes back to, uh, everybody talks a lot about Alan Turing. One of the things he did back in the 1930s is he proved something called the halting problem. He showed that there was a problem that you could not write a computer program to solve. It was the halting problem. It was non-algorithmic. This was not hand-weaving, hand-weaving, hand-waving. It was not philosophy. It was, um, it was rather something that was proved mathematically. Since then, there have been a whole slew of problems which you've shown to be non-algorithmic. Now, if it's non-algorithmic, it's not computable because all, all computer programs, including artificial intelligence, are, are algorithms. Uh, this has been added on to a lot by Gregory Chaitin, who is one of the greatest unheralded mathematicians of the 20th century, uh, mathematicians, um, computer scientists, who endorsed both of the books. Um, both, both of the books, uh, what, what, what book did I write? Uh, <laughs> uh, Non-computable non -computable You and, my, and Minding the Brain. brain. He, he endorsed them both. So this, this gives us, leads us to the question, and I'll end with this, are there aspects of the human being that are not computable? Now, if you are a naturalist, you believe that human beings are computers made out of meat. And therefore, if we're computers made out of meat, we should be able to simulate these computers made out of meat between our ears with silicon. I maintain that there is lots of evidence, in fact, some of it very, very compelling, that there are aspects of human behavior that are beyond computability. These would include creativity, sentience, and understanding. I think that there's some obvious ones, love, compassion, and empathy, but even digging deeper, uh, creativity, sentience, and understanding. And hopefully we'll have the chance to unpack some of this as we go on. Yeah, we'll unpack that as we go. And um, so um, to be a little bit simplistic, so George actually is one of those people who builds the models, right? We have Bob here, tinkers and plays around with the models and really just gets the insights. What are we actually gaining from these models? Now, as a philosopher for myself, there's always, I always will want a philosopher on the panel, right? Because we gotta have someone who's actually thinking about this thing. What are the implications of all this stuff? So, um, so in that regard, we have um, Bill Dembski. So, a mathematician and philosopher, Bill Dembski is the author, editor of more than 25 books as well as the writer of peer-reviewed articles spanning mathematics, engineering, biology, philosophy, and theology. Clearly a polymath. With doctorates in mathematics, University of Chicago, and philosophy, University of Illinois at Chicago, Bill is an active researcher in the field of intelligent design. But he is also a tech entrepreneur who builds educational software and websites, exploring how education can help to advance human freedom with the aid of technology. And I have to, now he won't give me this book, but hopefully I'll get one in the future. I love this book. I almost ordered it on Amazon, the old one. But now he has the Design Inference Second Edition out. This is now this is gonna this is gonna be a tough read, but it is. But Bill is Bill's a great writer. I think you'll enjoy it. So this is by Bill and uh, Winston Ewart, who does a lot of collaborations with Bill. And the book Design Inference: Eliminating Chance Through Small Probabilities. Great stuff. So I will turn it over to Bill. Thank you so much. So. Um, yeah, they uh, wanted a philosopher. I've actually collaborated with George and Bob uh, in actual computer science, theoretical computer science work. But uh, let's uh, try to take a higher 30,000 foot view. Uh, 2002, I was at a World Skeptics Conference and uh, I was speaking on intelligent design. I was invited there. 
And the big event there, though, was Marvin Vinsky was being given the In Praise of Reason Award. And when he was given the award, uh, and this Minsky, one of the founding fathers of AI, computers made of meat, that's, that's his phrase, uh, he, in his acceptance speech, he described how he was, uh, he, he was asked in a survey how long he would like to live. Uh, and he said uh, another 500 years. He thought that uh, he wanted that much more time to be creative. Now, as a mathematician, when I heard that, I'm thinking to myself, you know, most mathematicians do their greatest work when they're 20 or 30, so I'm not sure that that's, uh, you know, to be living another 500 years is all that great. But, uh, you know, I, I set the stage with that because uh, what we're talking about with digital immortality goes well beyond that. And so I'd like to, as a philosopher and maybe a pure mathematician, say, okay, what, what will that actually look like? What is digital immortality like? Because we're not talking classical immortality where you go to a non-material world where you can have actual Turing machines working. I mean, classical immortality thinks of either a god or a platonic heaven where you have an actual infinity and you can have an actual Turing machine. I'm told that uh, David Blackwell, the mathematician, uh, proposed a super, super computer in which it does its first computation in half a second, its next computation in a quarter second, its next computation in an eighth of a second, and so on. So it can solve any problem, do run an entire Turing machine uh, in eternity. So classical immortality has real Turing machines, but digital immortality, as we're being told by the singularity people, is really going to be a finite state machine with really only finitely many states and only finitely many computations. So how much are we really looking at? I mean, currently the fastest computer is a Cray EX uh, model. It's uh, the Frontier computer at, uh, uh, what is it, Oak Ridge Labs, uh, running at the exaflop scale. So, you know, 10 to the, what's, 15, 10 to 16 uh, floating point operations a second. How much faster can matter actually get? National Research Council back in 1996 was looking at the limits of computation for cryptographic purposes. You want to be sure that your crypto systems can resist any sort of brute force attack uh, with any sort of physics that you might be able to throw at it. And so they were looking at machines where they were saying, well, let's look at, we've got about 10 to the 27 protons in a kilogram, and light can travel the width of a proton in 10 to the, uh, 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So that gives you about 10 to the 52 computations a second potentially in a kilogram of matter. Uh, Seth Lloyd at uh, MIT, he's taken that further and for him the ideal laptop is one using quantum field theory and certain entropic considerations. You get to about 10 to the 50 uh, computational steps acting on 10 to the 30 uh, bits. Okay, so that's like 10 to the 80 and then he'll put the computational capacity of the universe at something like 10 to the 120 acting on 10 to the 90 bits. If you allow gravitational degrees of freedom up to 10 to the 120. So really 10 to the 240 uh, computational steps at the scale of the entire universe is as far as we're gonna get. Now you might say, well that's sure a lot more than what ChatGPT is using. So, you know, hey, sign me on, you know, let, let me be enhanced. That's a lot of computational power. But the think of it, you're having to run that, if, if it's really eternal, that's all you've got. And as a finite state system, eventually you're gonna be recurring. I mean, it's just a matter of combinatorics. You're gonna, you're gonna run, and probably if memory is not immaterial, if it's material and if you have to keep track of it, then you're gonna need something like a web archive to know where you've been. So, you know, you're gonna be storing all that stuff. So. You know, as I'm listen, as I think about this, you know, and sketch it out, it sure is a lot of computational power given what we have. But if I have, if that's all I've got for eternity, you know, I'm I'm not so sure I'm I'm impressed with that. Um, so closing thought, because I'm over my four minutes. 
but I, th I think, uh, you know, there are lots of areas, you know, I'm not impressed with complexity as though just complexity, you know, you can throw money at problems, you won't solve them. You can throw com computation at problems and you will not be able to solve them. At least that, that's what I would claim. So, uh, but, but here's, I think, the, the, the thought I'd like to leave you with. Poverty of the stimulus. Uh, Noam Chomsky probably made his career ov off of that. The idea being that humans are able to acquire language and do things with very little input. You know, ChatGPT, these ma language models, these other models require huge amounts of data inputted, and then they require a lot of training by people. I mean, so for instance, for ChatGPT to be pornography proof, they had to hire at two dollars an hour Kenyan workers, which was very traumatic for them going through things so that we with our Western eyes can be preserved from having to deal with that pornography. So, you know, it's the poverty of the stimulus. We are able to do more with less. And it seems to me what uh, the promise of computer science and the, in, in terms of the digital immortality is we're gonna do more with more. And it's not clear that in the end they are gonna do more with more, so thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bill. So with all that energy being used, will we get to heat death even faster? Uh, probably, yeah, I mean, because <laughs> it is heat. You know, it's a lot of heat that's generated. Oh, until there's I, no more usable energy in the universe. If I could, if I could follow up on that yeah, go ahead, from Bob. what Bill said, is that there is this idea that if we get enough connectivity, if we get enough computing power, that all of a sudden we're going to duplicate human consciousness. There is no proof of that. I, I reject that. I don't see any proof or any, uh, any reason to, to think about such things. Interestingly, um, Bob, a human brain weighs about three pounds, and we run on about 12 watts a day, one-fifth the power of a standard 60-watt light bulb. So how come a human can see a few cats and dogs and we can identify them, but with, say, ChatGPT, it needs to see literally millions or billions of cats and dogs to know what a cat or a dog is? Am I right, by, am I right at that? Yes. Sure. Yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, um, George, do you want to opine on that? Yeah. So, these systems, as I mentioned kind of in my opening comments, um, they work by, by absorption, right? So, they work by churning through this data and trying to extract essentially signal from these things that are a combination of signal and noise. Um, we did a, a paper in my research lab not too long ago where we looked at the memorization ability of different machine learning models. And we thought there was, there was a paper about um, neural networks and how they seem to memorize random data. If you feed it random data, it could just reproduce your data set. And we thought, do other models do the same thing? We found that pretty much all models, all your standard machine learning models will do this. They'll memorize to some extent. Um, and to the degree that you have information storage capacity in your model, the worse it could be. Um, so for these models, if you have 175 billion parameters, mm -hmm. that is a huge hard drive. Yeah. It, it could store a lot. And what you don't want it to do is memorize a specific example of a dog and say, this is the specific example of a dog. And the way to counteract that is essentially trying to saturate this capacity. And so this is why you need so much data for these large models, because if you don't, it's just going to overfit. It's just going to literally memorize the, the data bits you're giving it. Human beings are different. We do things differently. As you mentioned, we could see, you know, you give a, a child a couple examples. Yes, yeah, just a couple examples. And from that, they're able to extract the general concept. Mm -hmm. The systems that we've developed don't work that way. So they're, they're vastly different. Yeah, so I mean, clearly very different in terms, and how we can, and now they do this with literally hundreds of servers, right? Whereas we do it with a little three pound thing. So this is pretty advanced technology here that we've got in our heads. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, let me, um, now we talked a little bit, you had mentioned um, the, um, the, the um, Searle's Chinese Room. How many people here are familiar with the Searle's Chinese Room? Oh, I only see a few people. Oh, well, you're in for a treat. So, <laughs> Bob. Does ChatGP3 actually know what it's writing? And how does that, how does that relate to Searle's Chinese Room, this his experiment? Yeah, this appears to be one of the non-algorithmic things that uh, humans can do, which computers can't, which is understand. John Searle, 40 years ago, kind of got a smackdown on this. The computers don't understand what they're doing. Now, Searle didn't know Chinese. He couldn't write Chinese, couldn't read Chinese, didn't know anything about Chinese. So he said, imagine me locked in a room with a bunch of file cabinets 
Now, 40 years ago, they had file cabinets. We don't have them anymore. They're mostly PDF files, but imagine, imagine file cabinets. So through the door, he has slipped a little question, and the question is written in Chinese. Now, he doesn't understand what it is, but he goes through all of the file cabinets until he finds a match to the question, and uh, he pulls out the card, and below the, uh, below the question is the answer. So he writes down the answer, uh, in Chinese, which he doesn't understand, refouls the card, goes over and slips the card outside of the room. Now, from the outside, it looks whatever is happening on the inside is due to um, whatever is on the inside understands Chinese. But Searle doesn't understand Chinese, right? He's simply following an algorithm. Now, today's algorithm, like chat GPT, is a lot more complicated than, looking, than, than just table lookup. But nevertheless, it's the same thing. A little, uh, a little uh, sheet of paper is put through the room, into the room, that's the prompt, and then it goes through an algorithmic uh, number cruncher, outspits the answer. So does the machine understand what it's doing? The answer is absolutely not. Computers can add the numbers six and nine. Computers do not understand what the numbers six and nine are. If you remember IBM Watson beating the, uh, uh, be, be, beating the champions at Jeopardy a few Jeopardy, years ago, yeah. um, you think of IBM Watson. It won, but it was using all of Wikipedia, all of the web as its Chinese room. It didn't understand what the questions were. It didn't understand the answers. It was just going through a Chinese room sort of um, manipulation. Yeah, and humans were actually feeding it the questions. Yeah, feeding yeah. it the questions, and then it went and it, might, it, found, it found the right file cabinet and found the right answer. Okay, so George, um, tell us a little bit about why do we need prompt engineering? I mean, you just tell ChatGPT what you want, right? And you, and you get the same result every time, right? No. <laughs> so, you, so you don't get the same result every time. Um, but this is like a, a new industry that has arisen. Now there are people whose job titles are, are prompt engineers. And what you find is that essentially uh, ChatGPT or these, these la large language models, they have a lot of inputs to them, right? So the prompt is the input. Um, there is some latent representations, again, of, of words and their relations together. But to get anything useful out of it, you have to kind of direct it towards what of these relations do I want back. And so this is the, the point of a prompt. It's to try to find the magic combination of input vectors. So these, your words get represented as kind of points in space. If you find that right set of points that's connected to the other set of points that you want, then it could retrieve it. So this is, again, with the Chinese room analogy, you got to find that right character that's going to retrieve that right set of responses that you want. And so there's, there's a lot of freedom there for you to do. So wait, I have to think about how I ask the question? You actually do. Yeah, so there was an interesting, <laughs> this actually brings up an interesting um, example I saw. So I was at a conference in Greece not too long ago, um, and one of the speakers was showing some chat GPT-4 inputs where he gave the prompt, it was some facts about a Thessalonikian, I guess Thessalonikian, um, music artist, uh, Mikis Dora, the Theodorakis, right? And he said, you know, where he was born, where he studied, et cetera. And then he asked the system, Mikis Theodorakis is a citizen of blank. And it correctly said Greece. So he said, that's great. This is doing inference, right? As humans, we read through those facts. We could figure out that he's Greek. And then he thought, well, what if I change the name? So instead of Mikis Theodorakis, he said, what if it, I put Mickey God's gift, which is kind of a transliteration of the name, and ask the same question, same facts, and now it said he's a citizen of France. And so whatever GPT-4 was doing behind the scenes, um, it wasn't the actual inference that we thought it was doing, right? So the things that look like, uh, look like rational inference, they may just be simulated retrieval of some sort. And I think in that case, it, it seems to indicate that it was, it did have some facts about this very famous sing singer encoded in the relations in its system. Okay, great, great. So um, in the book um, by Michael Newton Keyes, who is a senior fellow at Discovery Institute, called um, The Seven Myths About the History and Future of Science and Religion, um, he has a great section on what he calls the a E T A I Enlightenment myth. Okay, so he writes this, and I'm directing this to Bob, and I will get to George and Bob, George and Bill. So Keys writes, um, there's an increasingly popular expectation that artificial intelligence produced by scientists and engineers will soon overtake humanity. According according to this view, AI will become exponentially super intelligent and reach a tipping point called the technological singularity. 
many singular, 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 singular retarians, as they are called, even claim that humans will achieve immortality and superintelligence when we merge with this future machine intelligence. The most sophisticated and charming defender of the singularity is our previous speaker, Ray Kurzweil, who is sometimes called the Thomas Edison of AI. So in 2005, Kurzweil said that the magical Harry Potter stories are not unreasonable visions of our world as it will exist only a few decades from now when the singularity arrives. Thanks to artificial intelligent technology, he claimed, the entire universe will become saturated with our intelligence. When that happens, the cosmos will wake up and be conscious and be sublimely intelligent. Everything is evolving towards infinite beauty, infinite creativity, infinite love. So the universe inevitably will become an entity that Kurzweil thinks resembles the traditional monotheistic idea of God. Bob, how do you unpack that? Yeah, I think Ray Kurzweil was, uh, was once asked, is there a God? And he said, not yet. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah, by the way, the idea of AI writing better AI, writing better AI, assumes that AI can be creative. AI has is not creative. This goes against something called the Lovelace test from Summer Brings You at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic that said you are creative, a computer program is creative if it does something beyond the intent or the explanation of the programmer. And that has not been passed yet, even by ChatGPT. There has been a recent, um, a recent evidence towards that I'd like George to talk about, which is model collapse. Can GPT write better GPT? Yeah, so uh, there's this phenomenon, which we, we've already kind of mentioned, where if, so, so the question arose like this. We have on the internet now text that's been produced by ChatGPT, right? Um, people write books that are AI assisted, et cetera. And so as time goes on, we're gonna have more and more text of the web is going to be actually AI generated. And so these researchers um, at, at various colleges in the UK, they thought, what will be the outcome of this? As we scrape the web for training data, we're essentially scraping outputs from these AI systems. And what they found was this phenomenon called model collapse. And model collapse is where you have a system where kind of in its first iteration, it's really good, right? So think chat GPT um, using GPT-4 right now. It's, it's a really good system. Then you get that system to output text, and then you use that text to train the system some more. And as you do this, the system will start to degenerate. And they found that this holds for large language models, this holds for variational autoencoders, so things that are, are made to recognize digits, for example. You start off being able to produce very clear examples of digits, and then you train on those output images some more, and you keep doing that, and eventually you get to these smudges, where all the, the images just look like smudges. Um, this works for even simple models, things like Gaussian mixture models, or even, um, I, I was talking to Bob and, and Walter about this, even if you have a single kind of Gaussian distribution, where a Gaussian, it's, you know, if you remember, it's this bell-shaped curve, where you have a mean and you have a variance, which says how thick it is, or how wide it's going to be. So if you have a Gaussian, and you produce samples from that Gaussian, then you use that sample to estimate the mean and the variance, and then you produce more samples from the new Gaussian, and you keep that process. What happens is eventually you get uh, a delta function. You get where it thinks that there's exactly all the probability mass on one point, and it just starts outputting that one value, which is typically going to be different than the actual mean. So it doesn't even land on the mean usually, but the variance quickly goes down to zero. Um, and there are striking examples of this online where you could see this in real time. You could see the kind of degeneration among these models. I'm gonna show you this just in a minute. Um, do, you have, do you have your slide or do you want to? If I could just jump in. I mean, yeah, yeah, this is ahead. really devastating to this idea of artificial intelligence because if you're gonna get this sort of singularity exponential explosion, there has to be an ability of learning to learn. You've gotta be able to improve radically and it's, it's kind of like an Aristotelian god who only thinks about himself because he's the greatest thing to think about. If you've got something that's, uh, you know, that's the greatest, most intelligent thing there is, you know, then humans are just pets, right? You know, so then you're going to be thinking about yourself, you're going to be generating all this data, and then uh, you're going to be collapsing because you're maybe not that creative and smart to 
to be learning to learn. So, so Bill, and we'll get back to you, Bob. I think you want to show, show some pictures are there. So, Bill, when you think about this, so you need that human creativity to be continually input to the system. How do you think that relates to intelligent design in terms of our universe and, and energy that needs to be intelligent or agency that needs to be imparted into, into it? And Steve, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, keep going. Well, you know, it's interesting when this comes back to Bob Metcalf and the idea of connectedness, you know, that uh, we, we need each other in some ways, you know, and these isolated computational systems, it seems that they're not gonna, they can't be uh, rich and growing richer and enhancing. But to your point about intelligent design, I mean, it, it seems that we need, we need to be inspired. We need information from outside the system to enrich us. You know, we've talked about oracles. You go back, I mean, this is an old notion. I mean, the Greeks, you know, they invoke the muses. I mean, what's the first line of uh, uh, Homer's Iliad? Uh, he, he invokes the goddess to sing of the wrath of Achilles, Peleus' son. So it's this idea of a muse, of an external information source inspiring us and the world it seems is essential. And then from an intelligent design perspective, you know, humans have not always been around. So what has inspired the world? What has brought, brought life to existence? Uh, well, it's a, it's a design. It's an information from that's, that's enriched the world. Walter, I, Thanks, I stepped yes, up to the podium because he mentioned uh, running the slide. Is that going to be done from the back? Or no, it's from going to be here? done right here. We have it. You're going to do yeah, it. Yeah, we have okay. a slide. Just, okay, just, so. just real quick, like, yeah. like George mentioned, uh, chat GPT, training another chat GPT, training another chat GPT, training another chat GPT. The uh, article that he mentioned went through nine generations of a large language model training the next one. It started out, the original response was about architecture. It was really good, revival architecture, St. St. John's Cathedral in London, and it went on for a very nice description. After nine generations of chat GPT, generating chat GPT, it ended, it says, architecture, in addition to being home to some of the world's largest populations of black-tailed jackrabbits, white-tailed jackrabbits, blue-tailed jackrabbits, yellow-tailed jackrabbits, uh, red-tailed jackrabbits, it, it's totally degenerated into blathering idiot. So what do you do, so, so it wasn't getting better. So, so what happens if you ask um, ChatGPT to describe an image? or not chat GPT, actually GPT-4. It, it, um, it, it takes an image and it describes it. Then you take that description, you go to Dolly, and you ask it to generate that image. It generates that image. You go back to GPT-4, you ask, describe this image. Do you get the idea? It goes back and forth between GPT-4 and Dolly uh, with describing the image and generating the image. This is what you get. If we could play the slide and keep on hitting repeat. That looks pretty cool. Yeah, Actually, go ahead, cool, go ahead and run it again. <laughs> well, you can see that it totally degenerates into idiocy. So at least from the idea of generative AI, AI generating better AI is kind of a moot issue now. It's very beautiful idiocy, it's would you say? It's very beautiful. <laughs> That's right. So... <laughs> So anyway, so um, so what I'd like to sort of um, so let, let's talk a little bit about in our time remaining. Let's talk a little bit about common sense, Bob. I know that's something you talked about quite a bit in your in your book on the non-computable you. Tell us about common sense. Well, this, this was a this was a big deal, and I think that actually Chat uh, GPT four has, has conquered um, common sense right now. It, it simulates it. In other words, it you can. You, you can give it a Winograd schema, says you can't chop down this tree with this ax because it's too small. Well, what's too small? Is it the tree or the ax? It's the ax that's too small. We can apply common sense to do it. Um, Fred Flintstone came, he got, a, he got his finger stuck in a bowling ball, and he asked Barney to go get a hammer because he couldn't get, he glued him in there. And when he came back, he said, uh, uh, he said okay, Barney, when I nod my head, hit it. <laughs> and it, 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 it was a big, vague pronoun, right? So Barney actually in the cartoon hit Fred in the head, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, somebody with common sense would know it. It looks like GPT-4 can do this right now because of attention is all you need has taken care of that. Okay. And so it, uh, it, it, it can grab that common sense. So that was because humans actually pro had recognized that as an issue and built that into the model. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Great. Well, um, I think we're close to, close to wrapping. So, um, Bill, so um, as a philosopher, um, I imagine 
in the far future. A child gazing at the sky one starry night, looking at a pale blue dot from the planet Europa. The child asks an adult, how did we get here? Were there people before us? The adult replies, the singularity is all there is, ever was, or ever will be. There was no one before us. Bill, in closing, can you give us your thoughts on that? You know, Walter gave me that, and I'm still thinking about what, what to say that's, uh, that's going to be memorable or, or whatnot. Uh, you know, singularity, I, I think in some ways it's a magical word. Uh, you know, we've seen tremendous progress, but the sort of progress we're being asked to accept here is something uh, that's beyond anything that we've experienced, I mean, that would have religious dimensions. So it's, uh, I could see somebody making that, that sort of case to a child, but it's, uh, you know, I think you have to ask yourself, what's the underlying reality? You know, when do the audit, you know, and I think what uh, George and Bob have done is uh, give you the audit and say, okay, let's look at these systems, let's look at the nuts and bolts, what they're, what they're really capable of, how they get to where they are, and what some of the, the weaknesses are. You know, I think we, we don't get that sense of the weaknesses from singularitarians uh, such as Ray Kurzweil. I mean, you know, he's... Uh, he's a, a fan of ChatGPT4, certainly, he's saying that it can write better than us. Well, but what's the criterion there? It's, uh, you know, that it can say something intelligible, somewhat defensible about just about everything. Okay, that's, that's nice. But, you know, when, when I was applying for jobs in philosophy, there was, uh, you, had, you had to put down your areas of competence and areas of specialization. Areas of competence, it seems to have wide sort of general competence where it can fake its way. Uh, but in terms of areas of specialization, I can't get more than about 1,500, 2,000 words of coherent text that tries to drill down on something from ChatGPT. Uh, so it's, it seems to me really quite limited. And so if I'm going to ascribe ultimate reality or something like uh, the pale blue dot, uh, you know, this is taken from Carl Sagan where he looks at the earth uh, from a distance and says, ah, we're insignificant because uh, we're, we're on this uh, tiny speck in the space of the universe. But, you know, Pascal's rejoinder uh, to that was by space, the universe encompasses me, but with my mind, I encompass the universe. So it's, you know, I think uh, we've, uh, I think the, the challenge for us is that we're not going to give ourselves enough credit that this illusion of possibility that somehow machines are going to surpass us is going to hurt us ultimately because we'll depend more less on our inherent capabilities and look to machines to do everything for us. And in the process, it's not that we're, we're going to become more human, but we're going to become more like these machines, and it's not going to be a good thing. Thank you so much, Bill. <laughs> Thank you to our panelists, Bill Dinsky, George Montanez, and Bob Marks. Thank you so much, everyone, for having us.